Okay. Um, this uh, fiscal year 21 public bond and budget hearing will come to order. Uh, just as a reminder, this is an informational, two informational uh, hearings. There'll be no decisions made tonight, but a chance to hear from about the bond and the, pub and the budget and to ask questions. So could I have a motion to move into the public bond hearing? Denise? So moved. Moved by Denise. There's a second. Second by Brian. All those in favor, raise your hand. Seven in favor. Okay, we're in the bond hearing. Dr. Morris? So before we begin, I'd like the board to introduce themselves. Tom Newkirk, Chair. Denise Day, Vice Chair. Al Holland. Dan Klein, Medbury Representative. Michael Williams. None of the microphones are right. That one is. Okay, should we start again? Tom Newkirk, Chair. Denise Day, Vice Chair. Al Holland. Dan Klein, Madbury Representative. Michael Williams. Ryan Cisneros, Lee Representative. Okay. But thank you everyone for coming out tonight. We greatly appreciate it. This is a um, pretty major event in the life of a school district when you start talking about the replacement of a school. So just to, to give you a sense of where we've been, this has been really a four-year journey for the school board. Uh, they've been thinking about the replacement of the current middle school for at least four years and longer. The school itself has served the district extremely well. And, you know, we're very proud of, of the service it's provided. It has been a um, elementary school, it's been a high school, and it's our current middle school. Um, in opening this, just to give you a sense of, you know, where we'd like to be as a school system, um, we're looking at uh, a school that's four uh, stories high, and we have rationale behind that that I will share as I go through the presentation. But just let's talk a little bit about the current school, and I'm going to ask Todd Allen to do this piece. Todd is a lifelong employee of the district. He's my assistant superintendent, and he's spent most of his career inside the current middle school. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Yes, I, I uh, was hired here in the Oyster River District in the fall of 1985, and I actually, uh, my first classroom was in the oldest part of uh, the, uh, the, current, the current middle school. In fact, it's now the art room after the last renovation back in the mid-90s. And I, I see some former students out in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, I, I have had quite a bit of experience uh, with the middle school project. I mean, first and foremost is its age, and actually this slide is actually old because it's now 2020, so the building is actually 84 years old. Um, it, it was originally built in 1936. It's been added on to, uh, it was added on to in the 50s, the 70s, the 80s, and again in the 90s. Um, you know, the most recent one was 1995. Um, over that time, it has served many purposes. Uh, it's been, as Dr. Moore said, it's been a high school, an elementary school, a middle school. Uh, for a, probably its longest history, um, Oyster River Elementary was the, the northwest end of the building and the middle school was that uh, southeast end of the building. So that, that was probably the, the longest part of its history. And now, most recently, it's a five to eight middle school. So since 1994, it's been a five to eight middle school. Um, so why a new school? Um, one of the things, as I said, I've had the opportunity to teach in most of the spaces in that building. Uh, I, I, as I told you, I've taught in the, some of the oldest classrooms on, on the, uh, in the oldest part of the building, but I've also taught in many of the newer classrooms as well. What are the, what are the concerns with it? First of all, and, and I'm just gonna go through these generally and then I'll come back and talk more specifically. There are safety issues both inside and outside that are challenging to manage. Uh, the, the academic spaces are inadequate, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, very efficient, inefficient building. Um, and maintenance has become a, a, a real challenge. Um, ADA compliance is, uh, we're minimally ADA compliant based on, you know, the, in 1995 we met those standards, but anybody who's certainly been in the middle school and tried to navigate that building realizes that that's, uh, you know, legally compliant versus you know, ethically compliant, we're not there. Uh, and then uh, looking at the potential costs of a renovation are pretty substantial. Um, you know, so th there is a, the issue of the cost of doing nothing, which we'll, we'll talk about more. 
First of all, the, the, the layout of the building, the current building is roughly three football fields long. Uh, this picture that you're looking at on the screen is a picture taken from the, the newest part of the building over on the, uh, the, 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 the code, uh, code drive side back towards the, uh, the what used to be Oyster River Elementary and the gym. Uh, again, 300 yards worth of uh, roof line multiple pieces of building that have been added on. Wherever you have old and new construction coming together, there are structural issues, roof issues, plumbing issues, all of those kind of things, uh, foundation cracks, and so forth. Uh, internally, uh, this is, a, this is pr a pretty a significant example of some of the internal plumbing that we are dealing with. And this is one of the ones we, uh, uh, we have found. Obviously, when we find plumbing issues of this kind, we fix them. Uh, and certainly that's something we do. We have had many times, however, when we discover a plumbing issue and when you go to fix it, you discover that the parts to fix it are no longer manufactured and you actually have to have it manufactured. And it's a lot more expensive to do it that way. So some of these repairs can end up being three and four times more than, than uh, you would expect. So I internally, there's a lot of that. And so this is what we found. Keep in mind that the building has plumbing and pipes and, and ductwork throughout it. And short of actually physically taking apart every wall, and you're not going to know until you start to take it down, the, the range of issues that are there. And there are, having lived through what we have uh, affectionately called sewer day back in 1996, where the, the septic system uh, backed up on us, there are issues. And obviously, they've had a similar sewer day this year. Um, so, that, so the plumbing is, is of, of concern. Uh, beyond that, we have safety issues. This is a picture from outside. Uh, anybody who has attempted to pick up or drop off a kid uh, at the middle school, you, you've gotten dragged into the traffic jam that, that is the, the traffic flow. One of the things that makes it challenging is when the building was built, there wasn't a lot of thought about how to use the footprint of the building. They were just simply adding on. So it's not a very efficiently laid out facility. So the, the parking lots and the play spaces and things like that overlap significantly. So this is a picture of kids. Uh, and this is so something that I, I know uh, middle school staff are very concerned about because um, every afternoon, and parents, rightfully so, look for efficient ways to drop their kid off and avoid having to be in the traffic jam. But what it does is it drops kids off or picks them up at places where they're crossing traffic and they're, they're going to places that are unsafe. Uh, this is just one, one example of that. And you can see the traffic snaking out onto Madbury Road, um, which is a major, major problem. Uh, in terms of classroom spaces, 45% uh, of the classroom spaces in the middle school are substandard. Uh, the state standard, uh, you know, they recommend 900 square feet as a typical classroom size. 45% of our classrooms do not meet that, and a lot of them are in that 600 square foot range. I mentioned to you that I taught in that classroom uh, on the uh, oldest part of the building. I also taught in the one directly above it, which is the, also the smallest room in the, the school. It's, it's just about 600 square feet. And if you've ever tried to work with 22 or 24 eighth graders in 600 square feet, um, you, you know how challenging that can be. Uh, this picture also shows you a little bit of the, some of the structural deficiencies of the space. People who I'm sure have been in that part of the building often wonder like, what is that on the ceiling? What is that kind of weird spray foam thing? That was what was perceived to be a solution to an acoustic problem many years ago. And so spray foam was put there. It, it did reduce the sound issue, but it certainly looks horrible. Um, but anyway, th that's in the 600 square foot room. Um, one of the things that's also changed in recent years and, and, and uh, hopefully will continue to grow as our music program is flourishing. And particularly at the middle school, we have over 400 kids that are engaged in, in instrumental music lessons of various kinds at the middle school. Uh, Right now, our orchestra meets in the cafeteria, uh, which is you know, acoustically not great. It's also a challenge that um, you have to schedule orchestra and band and musical uh, classes around lunch schedules. And because the cafeteria is as small as it is, you have to run four lunches. So effectively, the middle two hours of your day every day you can't have uh, orchestra or, or music classes going on. So it's, it limits the ability of the master schedule to meet student needs. Storage is a, an issue. This is a picture that shows kind of the, uh, how creative we've gotten uh, with 400 kids taking instrumental music lessons. That's 400 instruments that are brought to school every day. Uh, and so we have to find places to put them. Uh, 
uh, corners of locker rooms and places like that have been uh, seized. Obviously, that's not ideal for, uh, for storage of, of instruments. You probably have also noticed, if you've been in the middle school, in the back of the cafeteria, there's a whole bunch of storage lockers that are there also for that purpose. Again, not ideal for uh, the storage of instruments. As I mentioned, ADA compliance is a real issue. Uh, if you start on the, the, the gym end of the building, the, 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 the northwestern end of the building, and you try to navigate from that end of the building to get to the third floor, in order to do that, you have to go up this. This is a picture of the, uh, the, the uh, raised floor in a, in a wheelchair ramp on the right side. So if you are mobility impaired, you might need to use the, the lift that's on the right there. You then go to one elevator, which brings you up to the second floor, and then you have to switch to another elevator to get yourself to the third floor. Um, you know, can you get there? Yes, you can. But that's, it takes a long time, and it's, it's certainly, um, to, to call that compliant is, is a stretch. So clearly, the bottom line is this. The, the, the facility was, um, has done its job for the many years that we've had it. Uh, the, the creativity of our teachers using the facility has been amazing. But its, it's uh, life as a 21st century school has really come to an end, and uh, it's time to do something about it. So thank you, Todd. So, you know, giving you a sense of, you know, the condition of the current building, many of you have had children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews go through the current middle school and understand its deficiencies. Um, for those of you who haven't been in the school, I would point out um, Jay Richard. Jay, would you just stand? Um, Jay is the principal of the school, and he's more than willing to give uh, anyone a tour of the facility to give you a sense of it as well. So where do we start? We started um, thinking about the new middle school in terms of what we uh, hope to achieve. Well, clearly, you know, as Todd talked about, the 45% of the classrooms that are substandard, academics becomes a pretty important reason to do this. Um, Todd also pointed out the flourishing music program that we have. And so in some cases, classrooms don't even exist. That's why we're using the cafeteria. So academics, obviously, for a school system is a driving force, but sustainability became a really um, powerful force in, in thinking about this school and what we could do to build a school for today and for the future. And sust sustainability became an important uh, pillar of the new school. And then Todd also pointed out the safety issues. So if you think about children getting out and moving, traffic's moving slowly, Teenagers are teenagers, young teenagers, older teenagers, they don't pay much attention to traffic. And so they're weaving in and out of moving cars. Um, traffic is mixing in with buses on the back side of the building. That's also where our playground is. So safety became a real issue. And then the ADA compliance um, issue that, that Todd talks about. We are absolutely compliant. We were compliant in 1996. If we touch any part of the current building, we'll have to bring it up to code of 2020. So safety is an important piece. And then just the overall wellness of the building. Today we had um, our facilities director investigating why a, a classroom um, was smelling awful. And so, you know, wellness, air, uh, good air, air circulation and so forth became uh, one of the pillars. So we started out with these four issues, and um, we started focusing on how we could build a building for the future. And one way to do that is to build a super insulated building, and that's what we plan on doing. Another way of doing it is going up instead of out. We talked about a school that's three football fields long. The proposed school is half of that. And by going up, you take advantage of the natural direction of heat. But fundamentally, uh, we also wanted to move away from fossil fuels as much as we could. So this building is designed to be heated and cooled by geothermal, using the, the earth as the heating cooling system for this building. Now we will still have um, natural gas back up in the building because when temperatures are subarctic, um, geothermal would struggle to keep the building warm. So about 15% of the time we would expect to use the natural gas backup as opposed to 100% of the time 
uh, in the current school. So that gives you a sense of that. So the current school, the, the proposed school is 34% larger than the current school. Why is that? Well, Todd talked about the 600 square foot classrooms. So we wanted to create a standard that all the classrooms were 900 square feet with some classrooms, specialized classrooms like science and art, they would be 1,200 square feet because of the equipment involved. You end up with a spatially more efficient building because you're not traveling three football fields. So Todd talked about the roof. That's one way of looking at the length of this building. Another way to look at it is if you're a fifth grade student and you're on the third floor of the oldest section of the building and you're going to gym, you're going down three flights of stairs and traveling three football fields to get to the gym. So spatially, we wanted a school that was far more efficient. And then in terms of energy use, we anticipate this building will be 66% more efficient than the current building. We expect, estimate, that we'll go from 51 cents per kilowatt hour to 19 cents using these techniques. So that kind of gives you a sense of sustainability. And then at the very entry level of LEED certified, by using LEED, we can say to the public, we met the goals that we established. In terms of the safety issue, so Todd talked about kids interacting, buses interacting, and so forth. Not a great situation. In fact, Jay has teachers who beg him not to do the duty in the afternoon and the morning because it makes them too nervous. So Jay does it himself, and Bill does the backside, his assistant. And that's basically how we cover that duty. And if we, we have uh, more resilient teachers who are out there helping them. But Jay respects teachers enough to say, okay, if that duty makes you nervous, I'll put you on a different, uh, different duty. But part of that is Jay's philosophy of welcoming and Bill's philosophy of welcoming kids. But the, real, the fundamental reason is they want to make sure the kids are safe. When we thought about this design, we needed to think about separating the buses from the parent traffic. And so this design actually has a dedicated parent loop and a dedicated staff parking that does not cross lines with the buses. So the buses will come in off co-drive in the loop. And for those of you from Lee, you're familiar with this because this is exactly the technique we use at the Massway School. The buses come up in a dedicated drive and they come right back out. Works perfectly. It's a really cost-effective way of us separating the buses from um, the car traffic. And then in terms of the students, notice there's no road that connects the bus drop-off with the parent drop-off, meaning that the kids can be playing safely in the front or back of this building and not, we don't have to worry about a car or a truck hitting them. So the design is such to really emphasize the issue of safety. And in, this, in terms of the property, there are bigger poster boards on the back, but the current, where the current school is, becomes the field, where the field is, becomes the new school. Same property. We looked at alternatives. We looked at property outside of Durham. We looked at property that was available uh, in the uh, district. The, the problem with that is it adds to the cost of the building. You'd pay you know, upwards of $3 million, part of that property, part of that utility development, part of that um, site work, just to get to the place where we would be in building this school on the site we already own. The other advantage of the site we already own is its synergy with this high school. We have middle school kids who come up to this high school on a daily basis. We have some high school kids who go down to the middle school to support programming at the middle school. What we're really hoping is that we can get two-way traffic because if we're able to build this school, the voters support it on March 10th, we see a real um, possibility that we could provide music programming in the new school as well as the high school. So again, the design is four stories. The first story is um, designed to hold administration, counseling, um, special education programming, uh, the gymnasium. The gymnasium would be a high school size gymnasium in terms of its length and width, but not in terms of the size of the one we have here at the high school in terms of uh, stadium seating. 
It also would have an occupational therapy or uh, a room uh, off the side of it and many locker rooms because locker rooms at the middle school are, are just not as uh, utilized as they would be at the high school. The big, big piece uh, of, the, of the new uh, proposal is a recital hall and dedicated music space. So in the current school, we have one music classroom, one. Then we use a multi-purpose room. Then we use the cafeteria. And then we use a classroom that's probably 400 square feet. In the proposed school, uh, we're talking about putting in dedicated music space. And as Todd alluded to, the reason that that's so important is in our school system, music has become a driving educational force. Uh, last night we had a concert. It was magnificent. We had uh, strings, we had um, band instruments, we had choral, and it was just very, very exciting and beautiful and wonderful, and that's because it starts in the middle school. You know, when we talk about total music participation in the middle school, it's about two-thirds of the kids choosing an instrument to, to use. Now, the rest of the kids take music through their um, regular classrooms, but I'm talking about kids who go out of their way to say, I want to learn how to play this instrument, and they do. So having an orchestra room and having a band room, and then on the second floor, you'll see we put in a chorus room, but then ultimately, you know, a recital hall. What's the difference between a recital hall and a stage? So this stage is set up for drama. It has rigging that allows you to put in all kinds of special effects. It's very, very expensive. Compared to a recital hall stage, which this is ground level, this is floor, there is no stage. Why is that? The music teachers in our district said, please don't put a stage in this room. We want maximum flexibility so that we can have small groups, large groups, and then the seating area is designed to hold 900 people. And again, if you've attended concerts uh, in this room, it's not unusual now to have standing room only. Uh, we will have packed houses. Uh, last night was about three quarters full, but before Christmas we did an elementary uh, show and literally people were sitting on, on the stairs. So we get to a situation where um, we're over capacity. So dedicated music space, which then we can rent to, uh, for, for, for musical um, endeavors from outside the district. So you have this giant hallway, and you think, what on earth, why would you make a hallway that big? Well, what we didn't do is we didn't create a lunchroom on purpose. So we're gonna take advantage of this hallway. So the yellow in this picture is the library. So two periods a day, that hallway is being used for lunch. What are we using it for the other five periods? We're using it as a learning commons, an extension of the library. So kids can do projects, they can do work. The space is easily observed by administration and the librarian because it's trapped between the two ends of the building. It really becomes a flexible space. And that's also one of the things we tried to do in this building is make every space a, a space where teaching can happen. So rather than add another expensive box, a cafeteria, we took advantage of the hallway between the gym and the uh, uh, recital hall. The orange is the kitchen, so the kids would go in, get their food, and come out and eat in the uh, uh, learning commons, and then when they're done eating those two periods, it becomes an extension of classroom space. I talked a little bit about the gym. Is that, again, it's a high school size floor, but not a high school size gymnasium, which means that it can be used by the high school uh, to help in reducing the late, late nights that our kids are in this building doing practices because there's only one high school gymnasium. So practices could happen at the middle school, cutting down on time that kids are out at night. Not unusual for students to be getting home past nine o'clock because the space has to be shared by multiple teams. So this could be a real advantage to our students at the high school as well as the middle school. Talked about the recital hall. You know, there was a, a niche, in the initial drawings of this building, there was a lot of glass. We re reduced the glass significantly. 
However, you can't eliminate the glass because that's where you're getting your natural light. So about 25% of the space is set up for natural light. After a lot of feedback in the initial drawings of this room, we decided that the most effective use of this space was to put in soundboard instead of glass. And so uh, this just gives you a, a sense of what that room would be like. This is the second floor. So the middle school has electives, if you will, um, a little different than the high school, but the concept's the same. So the second floor would have World Language, which is the blue classrooms, another program that is growing very quickly in the district. It has health classrooms, that's the pinky col color in the, in the corner. The second floor of the uh, recital hall, and of course the, the gymnasium is two floors, and that's just showing you that it's the second floor. The yellow spaces at the top are STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math spaces, maker spaces. And in the front of the building, there are art spaces. Now, I would point out those two lightly colored boxes on each side that provide a um, space for art and STEM to work outside are really designed to expand the building. So if at some future point, the population of this school grows, these spaces are being designed to add additional classrooms. They won't be there in the beginning because we don't need them in the beginning. The third and fourth, fourth floors are identical. And right in the center of this drawing, you'll see two boxes with X's. Those are actually natural light, if you will, um, skylights, but they go through the third and fourth floor and provide natural light into the um, learning commons. They also provide natural light for the smaller special needs classrooms on each side. So it's a way of bringing natural light into the building and making sure those center classrooms don't feel claustrophobic. Going back to the classroom size, so you'll see in this drawing and the drawings behind you that three of the classrooms uh, in one color look like they're smaller than the fourth classroom. So the 900 square feet, whether you're fifth grade, 900 square feet, whether you're sixth grade, 900, whether you're seventh or eighth grade. So all the classrooms become unified. The bigger classrooms are science classrooms. Again, accounting for the equipment of science. And those little boxy things that you see in front of every color, those are lockers. And what we tried to do in this design is keep the lockers at middle school height and, you, and the tops then become um, spaces where kids can work, as opposed to having lockers over their head. So if you think about middle school kids, reaching over them is a very difficult thing when you're in fifth grade, and we often have kids having books and book bags bonk them on the head because you know, they're little and they're trying to reach over their heads. So levels of detail that you might not expect, we've thought about, we have. The colors represent teams. So this might be a fifth grade team, a, 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 two fifth grade teams and two sixth grade teams. Could be two seventh grade teams, two eighth grade teams. But by keeping the um, footprint exactly the same, it provides Jay and his staff maximum flexibility of how they want to arrange kids. A Couple of things I would point out in this drawing is you'll see four stairwells and two elevators, one at each end of the building. Again, that's to provide handicapped accessibility, and dedicated stairwells so you don't have 660 kids going down two stairwells. You literally are chunking the building up so that a stairwell is dedicated to a group of kids and you don't have to worry about them stomping on each other or rushing down and hurting each other, not because they intend to, but because that's the age. The other thing I would say is the first floor can be locked off so that nobody can get upstairs if there's ever a safety issue. So we've been in this process for officially for this, this school year. You all approved $800,000 in the current budget for us to do pre-design work. That's where, how we have all these drawings and why we're at the place we are. Well, the advantage to that is this. If you all approve the building of this school, on March 10th, then we literally will break ground on the new school in May. Normally there would be a large chunk of time between approval and beginning construction, but because you approve that, the 800,000 in this budget, the design work 
and the site work and the steel work and the concrete work really can be done very, very quickly and we'll be able to break ground in May. The idea is that from May to March of 2022, the building would be built. We would move the kids from the old school to the new school in March. You think, well, why would you do that? That's a bizarre time to move kids because we still have to tear down the old building. So we move, we move the kids into the new building, we tear down the old building, we build the field, we build the parent entrance and so forth. All that work happens between March and August. So the project would be complete in August. Kids would be in as early as March, but the project would have, all parts of the project would be done in August of 2022. So the board, you know, in, in thinking about this school, really has also thought about the taxpayers. We're all, all of us, obviously, are taxpayers in the district, and we know that taxes in the district are pretty hefty, and we also know that the school is a large part of that. So we had a lot of discussions about how do we make this school affordable because in the old days, meaning when this high school was added on to and renovated, um, there was state support. There hasn't been state support for school construction since 2008. And so communities in our situation have been building schools or renovating schools, um, Dover, brand new, new market, extensive renovation in addition. And, and fortunately, it falls on the local taxpayer. So a couple of things that the board has done. Is one is it's chosen to enter into this process using a, a level debt mechanism, which essentially means that um, we'll only be paying interest on the bond for the first three, where's Sue? Three, three years, two years. And then we do an interest um, principal payment and then we're we grow into principal, pay, uh, principal payments in the last two years. Why did, we, why did the board decide to do that? Because the bond on this school ends in, in 23. So if we went through this process the way that the board has decided, by the time the high school bond retires and we hit the fifth year, the budget for the school system will be able to absorb the debt payment of the new middle school. So it's gonna happen incrementally most school systems, most municipalities, when they go out to bond, do it overnight. And the tax impact is pretty dramatic. And you might recall the headlines from um, the paper related to the Dover High School and even the Newmarket project where, parents, uh, where citizens were shocked by the increase in taxes. It's largely because they bonded in a traditional way, which is overnight, principal and interest are due you know, in the fall, and. Um, Basically, that's, that's the giant impact on taxes. So by doing it the way the board has chosen, it has an incremental impact on taxes. And the board has also chosen to try to include the bond payment in the operating budget, which in the second public hearing, I'll be able to talk about a little bit more. So bond rates right now are at, at historic lows. Many of you may have approached refinancing your own houses in this climate. It's a great time to do it. The high school bond was 4%, so that would be, so this building was 4%. The bond bank just issued its most recent issue last week, and it came in at 2.15% for a 20-year bond. So in our estimates with the board, uh, we started out at 4.5%. Then we realized that was too high and we lowered it to three and a half percent and we felt, oh, that's too high and we're sitting at about 3% right now in our estimates. So we actually do anticipate it will come in less than, than 3%, but at this point, you know, the way that you would budget for this is you'd be relatively conservative because I don't want anyone to come back later and say, you said it was gonna be X and it turned out to be Y. I would anticipate that the estimates that Sue and I have been using actually are conservative and the, and the numbers should come down a little bit lower. Guaranteed maximum price, we hired the construction manager before we hired the architect. 
Why did we do that? We had a long-standing relationship with the construction manager, Boeing Construction. They did the field, they did the addition on Massway, they did the addition on, on the Moharamid School. They've been a proven entity for the school district. I wanted his eyes and ears, uh, Andre uh, Clouts, at the table when we were screening architects. I wanted his eyes and ears at the table when we were making decisions because no one knows what's happening more in the construction industry than person who's in the industry. And um, Andre has been a, an incredible asset. What he shared with me is that um, commercial construction is growing, the cost is growing four to six percent a year. So if the bond fails in, on the 10th and uh, we move forward, we can anticipate one, the guaranteed maximum price is out the window because he can't hold that price. And two, that the next iteration of the school um, would be more expensive per square foot than what we're proposing tonight. And then finally, a big piece of this is, of course, the high school bond retiring in 2023-24. Uh, Everybody wants to know what we think the cost is going to be, and remember, we're basing this on 3%. Um, um, so in Durham, on a two thousand on Lee and Medbury, $200,000 house, uh, the impact would be $115, $15, and $88, and in uh, if it was a $400,000 house, it would be $230, $29, and $175 on next year. Let me say that people always want me to project into the future. And if we look at the past five years, the relationship in terms of cost between the three towns changes dramatically based on the number of students being served and the valuation. So these numbers are pretty solid. If I were going to estimate um, into the future, the numbers would be far less solid. So but these numbers are, pr are pretty solid. So, let's see. Okay. Here's a nice little video that the architect built for us to give you a sense of what it would feel like walking into one of the team areas of the school. So this is a space right outside the classroom. This is the space looking down on the cafeteria, learning commons. And that's the natural light that's coming from the fourth floor into that space. And this is just the team across the way. So we have additional videos and um, we'll be showing them over, over the coming weeks. Um, we have one that's being built on the Performing Arts Center. We have one that's being built on the gymnasium. But it's 737, so I want to open it up to questions. If you have questions, would you come to the microphone? Also, write your name out, so because Wendy's taking the minutes, and we want to make sure we spell your name correctly. But if we can answer any questions, burning questions you have this evening, we'd be glad to. I always have one rule, and that rule is if I don't know the answer, I'm not going to make it up. But if you give me your name and your email address, I will make sure we get you the information. So the floor really is yours. If you have a question, please come to the microphone and be glad to answer it. So I'm Darren Keller from Lee. Um, just in uh, uh, the design piece of it, I know this is going to sound completely crazy. Um, one of the challenges I see with the building um, as it, that exists today is the location of elevators and stairwells and all that. And I know this is completely crazy, but thinking about future expansion in the future, um, where the building is sited. Um, that kind of stuff should be considered mm -hmm. because 20, 30 years down the road, um, uh, just looking at that design, it's the first time I've seen it like in, in the one that you showed. I think there's potential issues of uh, where the stairwells are located and how you would even build out from it. Mm -hmm. I think that should be a consideration. Um, uh, one of the feedbacks I have um, 
Uh, I hate to say this because I'm, I'm very pro-education. Um, I believe it's an investment in the future, but on the flip side, I'll probably be a little bit of an Archie Bunker right now. Um, one of the challenges I see, I really have a very strong feeling um, when we're talking about this bond. Um, you know, there was a lot of effort put towards the fields and the high school. We knew this was coming with the, the middle school, and I see that as a, a flip-flop of priorities. I think that should have come first. And I think to me that that's evidence that the school board, you know, you push through a, a smaller bond and then all of a sudden jam through another one. So it's really hard to trust the board that what's gonna, because right now I feel like what you're doing, you're trying to really squeeze the budget, squeeze the belt really tight, and make it look like reduce, basically reducing the, the cost of what it's really gonna be, because whatever we're deferring this year and next year, if this thing passes in March, I think it's gonna be a bait and switch, and then all of a sudden we're, you're, you're gonna come back to us and you're gonna say, oh, we didn't spend this in last year, now we gotta play catch up. Mm -hmm. So I'm, all I can speak for myself, I do, I feel that's the way this board is gonna act. Um, the other thing that I would like to do and I would suggest is, you know, if it was so important, the safety, the handicap, all of that, I support the middle school, I don't support an overlap. Um, I'm totally fine with supporting middle school after we paid off the other bond. So, thank you. Thanks. Um, so if I could just address some of your concerns, I think you'd be pleased to know that um, a number of them were under consideration as the board went forward. For example, um, the elevator issue, you're dead on. The current elevator situation is a nightmare at the middle school. Um, it literally doesn't go to the top floor. You have to get off one elevator and then scoot down to another elevator at another point in the building in order to get to the top floor. And if you're a handicapped student, it is a nightmare. So when we were designing this school, we put an elevator towards the front and we put an elevator towards the back. And in terms of the stairwells, the code only requires two stairwells and we put in four again to make sure that um, we didn't have crowded stairwells and it was safe. Uh, safe. Um, if I could just address a couple of your concerns related to what the board has done. Um, what the board has tried to do in the last five years is try to take big issues off the table so that when we got to the middle school, they weren't there to come back and bite us. So as an example, the entrance on the Massway School was a direct result of our intentional effort to try to create a safe entrance and add the additional classrooms on the Massway School so it wouldn't come back up after the bond has been paid. We did the same thing at Moharemet and in addition to that, that's why we did the field a little earlier, intentionally to try to get those big projects off so that when this school was built, um, we didn't have them haunting us. I think I answered most of your concerns. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I can talk to you offline. Okay, it's great. The, the, uh, really, the, it's the site, siting of the building and, and things like that, and, mm -hmm. and uh, how it's utilized. I, just, I, just, I personally see things that can be done differently. Well, okay, let's talk after the meeting then. Great, thank you. Lauren? Hi, I'm Lauren Selig from Durham. And, um, sorry, it's really loud. Um, I wanted just to commend you on the amount of work you've done. I went to some of the very early sessions, including one where I heard about the amount of glass. And as you know, I had a very strong visceral reaction to the you did. volume of <laughs> but glass. But we listened. You did, and I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I just really want to commend you for that. My one thing in terms of the bus loop and the parent driving thing. Um, you know, right now, Denison is structured so it's one way. Mm -hmm. Co is coming the other way. And so we have this other mashup. But the challenge is that there are many, many parents who drop children at both schools. And so I can't figure out from your design how a parent, because right now, if you are dropping at both schools, people either drop their kids not in a drop-off area or they do lots of extra loops. And so I just would encourage you to make sure you're thinking about sim smoothing that out or for the um, handful of people whose 16 year olds drop their younger children off at 90 miles an hour, <laughs> um, how to make it so they're less likely to have their kids run over. Thank you, Lauren, I appreciate that concern. And so um, we have been in um, lengthy conversations with the town. The town of Durham has been an incredible partner on this project and helping us uh, in terms of defining traffic patterns. 
And so, uh, you know, Lauren was pointing, pointing out that Denison is one way, Garrison is one way, and, um, and then Co Drive becomes a major, you know, thoroughfare through here. And so the, the issues that we were struggling with, uh, are struggling with, with the current school, Todd pointed out in his presentation, if you're there at a certain point in the morning or there at a certain point in the afternoon, traffic is backed up all the way out to the Madbury Road and, and onto the uh, Baghdad Road. And so we've been talking to the town about reversing um, garrison so it points towards the school. Right now, um, and I don't, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but Gar well you can see it, good. Um, garrison goes away from the school. So we've suggested to the town the possibility of having it go towards the school, which would take the traffic off of the Baghdad Road. They'd come ha have to come down to Garrison and come up towards the school. And then uh, Denison would remain in its current direction, which would bring the parents onto the loop. But we also anticipate parents aren't going to necessarily follow a grand plan any more than students do when they're on bicycles or walking. And um, so in that regard, um, what we truly anticipate is some parents will drop off on Garrison and the kids will walk to school. Some parents will drop off at the Denison Road and the kids will walk to school. Some parents will go all the way down to the parent loop. Some parents will drop off on Co-Drive. But the advantage of this conversation we're having with the town of Durham is uh, we break the congestion up. It's like, uh, you know, it won't be perfect because it's an inner city school. But um, in working with the town, we really feel like we've got a workable plan that will mitigate a lot of the craziness that happens at the current school. And the most important piece, of course, in this road design, in this drop-off space, is that kids aren't in the middle of it. So there is a sidewalk on Garrison that ultimately, um, in the conversations, not necessarily in year one, but as we observe how the traffic pattern really uh, implements itself, we may flip the walkway onto the um, other side of the road. The Baghdad Road will have a walkway. We'll have a bike path into the property. Um, so we think that this design is going to be far, far better than, than what we have now. I know in an ideal world, we do a whole lot of other things. But the reality is, you know, nothing ever really hits ideal. But I think it'll be very good because it's very thoughtful, and I think it'll work um, way better than the current current standard. So we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, the town of Durham being so cooperative and working with us. Mike Lehrman from Durham. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very concise, and I thought very well ordered. So oh, you're welcome, Mike. Kudos. Um, question I have, I realize you're going to talk about operating budgets later, I think, mm -hmm. but in the context of this, if you could just address a little bit now relative to this capital project, what if any um, operating costs might be saved besides the, the heating you know, energy costs, which you've sure. sort of put up there, more in terms of labor costs, mm -hmm. um, print size, more efficient you know, all that things. Yeah, so, you know, the building's going to be bigger, so I don't anticipate, I mean, in terms of square footage, it'll be bigger. Uh, so the custodial costs shouldn't, shouldn't change, but will change dramatically besides your utility cost is your maintenance cost. So Todd alluded to the cost of maintaining the current building. I give you a specific example. We had to have an HVAC piece customized built for us because it was no longer manufactured, that one piece cost us $7,500. Same piece at the high school or Massway or Moharamet would have cost us probably $450. So those are the kinds of uh, savings. Uh, obviously, uh, we've put in, as anybody in, in Medbury and, and in Lee knows, we put in brand new windows throughout those schools. You know, we put in the addition in Lee, we put in the safety entrances. So when we look at this school, the safety entrance is part of the design. So in this particular drawing, let me just show you, um, the red is where administration is and where counseling is and some special ed programs. But all traffic for this school comes in through the front door. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't four exits at those stairwells because we need them for emergency exits of students. And, but they won't be entrances that Sta that students and, and parents use to come into the building, nor staff. Everybody's going to be coming in through the front. 
The front's designed purposefully so that people have to stop in to the office before they can move into the main building. And so, you know, and when I think about savings, I think about enormous maintenance savings. Then, you know, we can say savings is relative because you're gonna be paying a bond, but you're not gonna be trying to fix a building where um, we have to pay for parts to be made. And we, don't, we won't be replacing those windows. We won't be replacing that roof. I mean, there's a lot. The building is incredible. So I want to make sure you guys know this. Building is kept incredibly clean. Our custodial staff is doing a major job. One of the things when they talk about maintenance, uh, my maintenance director, Jim Rizicki, says, please tell them we take care of the building. So we do take care of the building, as well as we do Massway and Moharamet and the high school. It's just that structurally there's a lot here that will come back and haunt, uh, haunt us all as taxpayers if we, um, we continue to, to, to try to service this building. It's, it's a very expensive building to maintain at this point. So I would say maintenance cost is the big issue. When we designed this building, we designed it in, in as maintenance free as possible. In other words, nobody's gonna get out in front of this building in five years and have to paint the eaves. They're not gonna be paintable. You know, it's going to be permanent. It's going to be that color. There's, so you're not going to get into, oh, wow, that paint's chipping. It's only five years old. There won't be any paint on the outside of the building because it's a maintenance issue. We, we're designing this building so it is maintenance friendly. So that would be, that would be the kind of savings I would, I, would, I would think would be beneficial to all of us as taxpayers. Hi, my name is Jean Nielsen. I'm from Lee. Um, I'm a designer, and I just had a couple of questions about sure. the design. Um, the bus drop-off location, I guess my thought was the security of that, having it right out on Co Drive, right out in front of this, the school mm -hmm. um, for any you know, security situation. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's not any different than what we have at Massway. So Massway, we bring in Which I don't the, love. <laughs> the, 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 the yeah. staff is right there yeah. to supervise the kids dropping off. Uh, so I'm not I'm less concerned about our safety issues related to the bus and more our safety issues of where parents drop off kids because they, they're dropping off kids outside of our viewpoint. So we have people on duty at, at drop offs. It, um, we had spoken earlier mm -hmm. about um, the Stockbridge theater at, in, at Pinkerton in Derry, they rent out and they have concerts and offset some of the costs there. Concern that I have on the plan is what about uh, capacity of parking? Yeah. To have, you know, because the field is great, but yeah. I'm looking at this thinking this might get some of the parents and some of the staff um, so that's just, you know, no, it's I'm a being great my observation. nitpicky you yeah. know, designer here. Yeah. Um, the library doesn't have any exterior windows. Yeah, it and does. I just it looks out would... onto the outside. Yeah. The library's in a really, if you look at the location of the library, yeah. that looks straight out onto the, into okay, the foliage. Okay, because I didn't see any windows on that end. So yeah. I just was it's just, a concept just questioning yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Um, and then I'm sure you probably have an air-to-air -air exchanger in the, in the system. Mm -hmm. Are any of the windows going to be operating So that's loud? a good question. So let me do both of your questions. Yeah. So in terms of parking, it's in an inner city school and parking's always at a premium. Um, we thought at first we would get 200 uh, parking slots. Um, on site, there will be um, 100, but we're maintaining the parking on, oops, throwing drawing, sorry. The, we're main paint, maintaining the parking on Denison, this, that slide-in parking. It's just going to be reversed, and so we'll have that space. And I'm working with the town about the possibility of having um, a, a, a parking on Co Drive. So uh, that's uh, that's going to, if that happens and Denison happens, and we have the on-site parking, we'll be at about 200 slots. But will that accommodate for the 900? No. Recital hall. Yeah. That's that's my so, question. And, and it doesn't here either. So when, right. if you've been to a concert here, yeah. people park up along Co Drive. They park in the student parking. They park on staff parking. Um, and the and the and the Durham police have been incredibly accommodating when we have uh, concerts. So um, two things: uh, the, the on-site parking, about 200 slots. But you also have the high school parking, and we may just have to shuttle. 
Okay. You know, at that so point, that's the, con that's long the concept. Long term, long term. That's the concept we've been playing with is, yeah. is shuttling if, when we have events. And then your other question that I wanted to get back to was um, the room. Well, um, windows and, yeah. and so, yeah. operating windows versus Yeah, on operating windows. No yeah. operating windows. Okay. Okay, so in the old days when we built a multi-story building, we had these giant windows and we opened them up from top to bottom because I went to one of those. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to create an energy efficient school, what you do is um, you put in triple pane windows that don't open, but you put in ventil right. ventilation systems that are mechanical right. that maintain the fresh air in the building. And since we're using geothermal, basically air, air conditioning for this building is free because right. we're putting the geothermal to do heating, you'll have you'll ha automatically have the option of cooling the building as well. So as long so, as the sec security and evacuation plan can go along with all of that and not being closed in well, or you wouldn't, trapped in. Yeah, you wouldn't have any, you wouldn't be ev evacuating anyone uh, right. from the oh. third and fourth floor anyway right. through a window. You'd have to use your stairwells. The elevators would be off. And we train people to move the kids who have serious in handicaps. Right. So the first floor, obviously great got all right. kinds of exits. Second floor, third floor, and fourth floor, you have those four stairwells right. that, that will work. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for asking. <laughs> hi. Okay. Hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, Sylvia Rua, this is Layla Rua, future middle schooler. We live in Durham. Um, so this may be something that's addressed uh, later, but we have bedtime, um, which is Article 5 of the uh, proposal around um, cost savings for, uh, it looks like, teacher contracts. Yep. Um, so just concerned around, it looks like there's a 1.3% increase for teacher salaries and increases in contributions for health insurance. So I'm really excited about this new school and uh, all of the things that are gonna be brought as a value added for students, um, but just wanted to give a voice to recruiting the kind of teachers that we would want and retaining teachers that we would want in these type of positions um, and you know, greater contributions to health insurance, you know, pay increases that are not keeping up with the cost of living. This is not the way to do that. Okay. Um, and so I would just wanted to make that known as a resident of Durham uh, and someone who cares about public education, uh, you know, very much in the future of um, public education in this town. I think everybody would forgive me to answer your question, even though it's not part of the, sure. this presentation. Uh, the teachers, we negotiated a 3% increase with the teachers. So when you're doing your calculation, you're probably basing it on the total budget, not on the teacher right, part yep. of the budget. So the teachers, uh, in the reduction of um, plans, they still have a choice. They can stay with the plan they are, but we found a, a really nice plan that they can choose to have. So not imposing that on them. And then you the mean big, the, the high deductible yeah, health insurance yeah. plans? The high deductible is three thousand dollars, so yeah. it's not like an eight thousand dollar plan. Right, and but it's, again, it's at the yep. teacher's discretion, so they can stay on the current plan. And then the um, reduction. They can stay on the current plan if they c contribute at a higher rate. Uh, no, well. So. So uh, greater participation by teachers and yeah, health an, insurance, which yeah. usually translates into like, an, them paying. Yeah. So I don't um, know what the percentage is now, if it's 90-10 so, or 80-20. Five years ago, it was 98-2. Uh, okay. And um, we set a goal of 80-20. Okay. Because that's the industry standard. And we felt that was fair. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the teachers felt that was fair. So yeah. I think we've taken care of the teachers pretty well. Yep. And, and they, they were thrilled with the contract. It passed 100%. There was no negative vote towards their contract. So okay. they're, they're, in good, they're in good shape. But thank you for asking. Thank you. Good night, sweetie. Can you say good night? <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Dean Rubine from Lee. I'm lucky I got here tonight. I passed a gang of middle-aged men with uh, squash rackets on the mean streets of the inner city of Durham. <laughs> <laughs> it's touch and go there for a while. Uh, Thanks, Dean. I thought I'd, uh, <laughs> I thought I'd ask the part of uh, Darren's question that didn't get answered, which was, why aren't we waiting for the high school bond to end before we start? Sure. 
uh, and what are we sort of doing that's sort of well. Yep. So the reason we didn't wait for the high school bond to end is because construction costs are rising four to six percent a year. So if we waited until the construction bond for the high school ended, the cost we would be looking at would be 15 percent higher than what we're looking at today. And so uh, to mitigate that, the board chose the debt le level debt process so that we were paying interest, interest, and then the high school ends, and then we're paying interest and principal on the new school. So it was a, it's a timing issue to take advantage of uh, the lower um, bond rates and also to take advantage of time to, you know, to, to build up to the full bond payment five years down the road. So it was just, it was strategy. Thanks, Dean. I'm gonna leave some spaces here because I think some of the speakers didn't add all their names. I don't know. Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so frightened by this gang. Pickleball gang, by the way. Uh, good evening, my name is Steve Wargiotis, Durham. And thanks very much to the board, superintendent, and all the staff who have been working so hard to bring this to possibility. Thank you very much. I have a question that is related to deans. And I have two questions that are around finance and cost. One of those, and I believe that you started to answer it, maybe your answer was complete there, Dr. Morse, was if we were to wait, what would the cost be? We see the you know, potential 5% per annum increase on the actual construction costs. I also know uh, that a 2% versus say a 3% or a 4% bond generates uh, an incremental interest expense that can sure. be much higher than we might assume, oh, it's just a couple of percentage points, but I know that adds up especially over 20 years. So my first question is what kind of impact would we see in total if we were to delay Mm -hmm. And maybe it would be helpful for the community to understand what those cost savings are in a very clear way. So we're like, oh, okay, totally makes sense, happy with it. The second question is uh, if we think about the, I think the assistant superintendent, Todd Allen was saying we have a cost of not doing anything. And so when the community is faced with a cost of $50 million, we think, oh, $50 million, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. And yet, if we did nothing, we would be incurring cost. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the operating costs that you were just explaining or who knows what other capital expenditures we might re be required to pay. So I'm also just wondering what kind of costs should we be aware of mm -hmm. that we are eliminating and saving that might offset some of that $50 million. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Um, so when Sue and I first estimated the bond, we used 4.5%. Um, it was at the presentation in Mohammed last fall. And the full bond payment was someplace, Sue hates it when I do this, someplace in the nature of uh, $3,300,000 a year. At 3%, the bond payment becomes $3 million. So basically, it's a 10% reduction uh, from where we, at our initial estimate per year for the length of the bond. So that's a considerable amount of money. That's not, that's not a little bit of money, that's a lot of money. And, and then in, in terms of, of Steve's second question, um, <coughs> the cost of doing nothing, you know, this is a question that actually the chair and I have had many conversations about. Um, the, the, the efforts that we've put uh, in each of the buildings Massway, Moharamet, and, and the high school were um, designed to keep these facilities in current shape, good shape. Example, we replaced all the lighting in the three buildings. It's all LED lighting now, which is incredibly energy efficient. We did not invest that into the old middle school because we were anticipating that we would be having this presentation with all of you. We replaced all the windows in the two um, elementary schools. We did not do that at the current middle school because we felt like you would all want to shoot us if we invested a million dollars worth of win windows in a school that then we come forward 
you know, three years later and say, oh, by the way, we want to replace that school. And just so you know, that happens. I was superintendent in the city of Portland, and they had replaced all the windows in the school, and then the following year, went to the voters and said, we want to tear that school down and build a new one. So you know, the board thinks in a future-oriented way, I think in a future-oriented way, and we, we try to work through this. We replaced all the boilers in the elementary schools. Um, the boilers were replaced in the current middle school, but a cost savings, going back to Mike's question, is that we wouldn't buy new boilers for the new school because we already have boilers that we can use in the new school that are relatively new. And we knew that, again, thinking about the issue of um, backing up uh, our heating system. The roof, the roof is a million dollar proposition um, in the current school. It would cost us a million dollars to go from one end to the other. And um, then the ventilation units on the middle school, I want to say there's six or eight of them. Um, we already have had to replace two of them uh, to the tune of uh, about $50,000. So, you know, when you look at the current school and, you know, if this, this bond uh, fails, then there's sizable amounts of dollars in the millions that we would have to do just to do the minimal stuff the building needs. But most importantly, in terms of Steve's question, if we continue to use the current school, it doesn't address the substandard classroom space, the travel time from students from the third floor to the, to the gymnasium. It doesn't address any of the academic issues. It doesn't address any of the safety issues. So, um, you know, there's really some compelling reasons uh, beyond, uh, um, beyond age that we need to consider when we're thinking about uh, keeping the current school because keeping the, the current school is not free. It, it'll cost millions of dollars to keep that school operational and it solves none of the issues that we talked about tonight. Did that do it, Steve? Was that, did I get it? Okay. Questions? Other questions? My name is Amit Juglekar. I just had a question, but I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys understand this better. Is why is the tax implication so different for Durham <laughs> residents versus Lee versus Madbury? Yeah. And yeah. second, yeah, I know. And secondly, is uh, what's the percentage required for this thing to pass in March? Say, say the second question again. Percent. Uh, in, during the vote, 60 percent requirement? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the, the difference between the three towns is based on the funding formula of the school system. So uh, the school system's funding is based on the number of students coming from a particular town. It's also based on the assessed value of a particular town, the property value of a town. And so those two things change. That relationship changes between the three towns every single year. So um, that's one of the reasons why when Sue and I are asked to project cost into the future, we're just making guesses that Dean could do in his living room because the information that we would need to make that accurate assessment doesn't exist. And so, um, you know, everybody makes educated guesses and Dean and I have great debates about his educated guesses versus my educated guesses, but everybody's doing it with genuine intent. So it really boils down to the relationship between uh, the towns in terms of good examples. Um, Lee's student population has been growing. If you live in Lee, you've seen the many developments that have been going up. On the other hand, Durham just finished a pretty massive increase in property value through development of student housing, private student housing, and that kind of thing. That's come to an end, and, and so there's other development being planned in town, but it doesn't impact the funding formula until it's, it actually exists. And so in any given town, things happen. Uh, one year, as an example, um, Little Tiny Medbury, which is the smallest partner of the three towns, ended up with a tax increase that was over a dollar per thousand because their value and their student population went up in relation to the two larger towns. So it changes every single year because of the dynamics of those two pieces. And then the third piece that's outside the funding formula is the adequacy aid that the state provides each town. So, you know, the impact on the town of Lee for next year's budget is astronomically small 
and it's very unusual for it to be that little. The reason it's going to be that little, and we'll talk about it in the next presentation, is because the state gave the town of Lee about $450,000 more in education dollars than we were anticipating when we built the budget, and it drove the tax effort down considerably. So it, it happens every single year, and, and I, I know that Sue and I wish that we could be like right on every single time we talk about taxes. It isn't us being evasive, it's the variables change, and so it changes every year. And in terms of the vote, thank you for asking this question, um, it does require 60% of the people who vote in order to approve this bond. So no matter how many people come out, whether it's 5,000 or 10,000, it requires 60% of that number of voters on that particular day. So the day we vote is March 10th. Um, please have that in your calendars, yay or nay, that's your opportunity to say we support or don't support. Um, and obviously, from my perspective, you know what I would hope you would do, but I can't tell you to do that. You have to make your own mind up based on the information we provide. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Could I have a motion to end the bond hearing? Denise? I so move. Moved by Denise, second by Dan. All in favor of ending the bond hearing, raise your hand. Could I have a motion to enter into the budget hearing? Denise? Yep, so moved. Moved by Denise, second by hey, Brian. All those in favor? Raise your hand. Okay, the bond hearing is now open. Uh, budget hearing is now open. B budget hearing is now open. Okay, well, thank you again for your patience this evening. Um, this hearing is really very, very long this year because of the middle school bond. We had to have you know, a special public hearing just on it. Uh, the budget itself, um, I think most of you will be incredibly impressed with. The board um, is very proud of the work that our staff and our students are doing. Um, you all should feel great pride in how your students are doing. We have some objective measures and we have some qualitative measures that I would share. Let me just start out by saying this weekend. This weekend, there were four events going on in the school district from basketball games where Joe Morrell got his thousandth point to robotics programs where the entire middle school gymnasium was filled with enthusiastic students and their parent audience in a robotics competition. Um, we had a wonderful winter concert this, this, uh, this past evening. And so there are just so many things that are happening in this district to be proud of. But one of the baseline pieces is, um, you know, how do we do when we're compared with other systems? So as we go into this part of the public hearing, um, the board was very specific and held its own feet to the fire. It really wanted to make sure that the budget we presented to you tonight was frugal. And I think you'll agree by the time we get done, they did an impressive job. They wanted to make sure the budget I presented to you tonight included all negotiated agreements. They wanted to make sure the budget that I presented to you tonight included the cost of the new middle school bond. And they wanted to make sure that the fiscal impact didn't exceed a 3.5% apportionment amount to each town. That was their budget goal. But in terms of where we are as a district, um, we are one of the highest performing districts in the state of New Hampshire. Our SAT aggregate was 1144, and we had 96% of our kids uh, participate. Our math scores are second, only the Hanover. We're doing a fantastic job in terms of qu qualitative measures. Co college placement rate, 81% of our kids. High school graduation rate, 98% um, of our kids. So, you know, this is why families are moving into the district. They feel like they're getting a great school system when they do. In fact, I got an email from a high school student who moved in from Dover that I shared with the board today in email, where the first thing he says to me was, you know, dear Superintendent Moss, I've moved in from Dover, and I, can't, I just want you to know what a loving, caring um, high school experience I'm having. Um, so he was articulating that he felt like a person and 
it was really a very um, gratifying email for a superintendent to get, so I wanted to make sure the board got it. Because so often when we think about budgets, we only think about numbers. And that is an important part of a budget, but behind those numbers are the services we offer children. Going to that level, we all assume that all of Oyster River students are going off to great colleges and great opportunities because they're driven and they're talented. We also have students who are going off to great opportunities and challenges who weren't given all the same gifts. They have disabilities, and yet in our school system, 100% of our kids with uh, special needs graduate compared to 67% in the country. So we talk about what a great experience it is for our high school kids, that includes our special needs population. Almost a quarter of those kids go on to a four-year college. 13% of them go into a one, two, or three-year program. 32% of them go into employment in this particular year, none went into the military. But you know, if you want to feel good about Oyster River, this is the slide that I always point out because this is what makes me the proudest of Oyster River. Um, we do a great job with kids who are capable and really driven, and we do a great job with kids who have a handicap to their learning, but also are capable. And we believe in these kids, and as a result, we get these kind of results. And I really can't speak more highly of our special needs po uh, program and, and uh, Catherine Plourd and the teachers and the administrators who make it happen. Big issue when I came in eight years ago is Oyster River's population is dropping. The current population is over 2,200 kids. That's including the 170 kids that we get tuition from, from the town of Barrington, and our 24 preschool little ones who come to school at the high school, of all places, and uh, service there. Uh, we have an incredible committee, the Long Range Planning Committee, that's been doing work in terms of our enrollment projections for literally decades. People like you or me who are sitting on a committee customizing enrollment projections. And you can see from these pro projections uh, in the next five years, we maintain a population of over 3,000, uh, 2,000. And um, so we're, we're in a good shape there. Uh, to give you a sense of enrollment by town, this is the issue that I was talking about earlier. You know, Lee's, uh, excuse me, Durham's population is, you know, going down. If you look at it from a, from a uh, six-year perspective, Lee's is going up. That plays into the, the relationship and the funding formula. And Madbury's is um, overall going down. It, there's a big variance there from year to year at Madbury. And that gives you the sense of what's happening with the Barrington tuition students. You know, six years ago it was 85 kids, today it's 167. So where were we in this process when we talk about a frugal budget? Um, so the administrators uh, presented me with a budget that was 4.28% higher than the budget we're working under now. The board's goal was clear. Uh, that meant that that budget had to be reduced um, I reduced it by almost a million dollars uh, by myself, working with the administrators. And then through various workshops with the board, we, we reduced it another $633,000. And then finally, um, in the most recent board meeting, we reduced it yet again um, by $265,000. So the proposed operating budget initially at my table was 4.28%. The proposed operating budget was less than a, a quarter of a percent at 0.2 percent. So pretty dramatic. Um, why? Why is it that dramatic? Go back to the board goal. The board goal said we want the teacher's contract and we want the bond for the middle school inside our operating budget. So the guild contract uh, for next year is proposed at $627,364. That gets added back in. The bond for the middle school, we're estimating at $625,000. That gets back, added back in. So the net growth of the budget is 2.8%, 2.83%. 
Um, every budget has significant drivers. One of them I just said, the teacher's contract. The other is health insurance. Our health insurance came in at a guaranteed maximum of 8.6%. That's $459,000. So where was the magic in bringing this budget down so we could include the teacher's contract and we can include the bond? It was in largely the capital account. We reduced the capital account by $749,305. There were other reductions, don't get me wrong, but that's the big one. And so that brings us to where we are compared to where we've been. So this is um, the lowest increase in the district's budget in six years. And it includes the bond for the middle school and it includes the teacher's uh, contract. So that's why I said at the beginning, the board has been incredibly frugal in putting together a budget because they want the bond for the middle school not to turn out to be a huge impact on taxpayers. And of course, um, the teacher's contract also uh, being almost as much as the bond for the middle school needed to be included in our total budget. So here we are um, with all of the numbers added together. We're proposing a $47,326,181 budget. Uh, this just gives you the cost centers, where the money goes, and almost all, of course, goes into the schoolhouses. Um, where it should. Then we look at the impact of the uh, bond, the proposed budget, and the guild warrant. The impact on the town of Durham uh, at this point is estimated at 57 cents per thousand, Lee at seven cents per thousand, and um, Madbury at 44 cents per thousand. So for, you, for all of you who aren't familiar with this process, this is the crystal ball I was talking about. So Sue is, Sue Caswell is my business manager sitting here to my right. Um, we are estimating on what we know. What we don't know is we don't know what the assessed value will be in the towns um, next fall. And we don't know what the student population of each town will be next fall. So we base these numbers on current um, uh, relationship between the town in terms of property value and current enrollment. The reason I share that with you is here's the history of our projections and our actuals. Just to give you a sense, uh, last year we thought that at this time, we thought that the tax impact of the budget increase on the town of Lee was going to be $1.92 per thousand. It was going to be massive. It turned out to be 92 cents per thousand. Still significant, but not $1.92. What changed? Three things changed. One, I have alluded to already, the state put in more money for the town of Lee, almost $450,000. The, the, the school system put in 300,000 to lower the overall impact of the three towns because it's shared. And then the town of Lee itself pulled money out of their reserve funds to lower the impact. So again, you know, as we're looking at the impact of the budget, uh, we make very conservative estimates and we give you this history so you can compare what, I, what we projected and what actually happened in any given town in any given year. So this is a weird one. You're kind of gonna go scratch your head. How does this happen? If our budget fails, what will happen is the default budget will increase the budget by $702,620. That's happened twice in the eight years that um, I've presented budgets, uh, seven, seven years I presented budget, this is my eighth year. And um, it's the result of uh, two things. Uh, the amount of money that we did send to the three towns, we anticipated it being 400, 350 and we sent 700 thereabouts. And um, the reduction that we made in the capital account of seven hundred and forty plus thousand dollars. So um, you want this budget to pass, <laughs> otherwise you're going to increase the amount of money that we're going to need for the school. And I would tell you that from the school's perspective, we feel like the budget we're presenting you is is adequate to do the task. We're not cutting any student programs, any teachers, or any of that kind of stuff. And so. Um, 
uh, you know, as you consider this budget, the impact is the default budget would be significantly higher. Um, these are just the articles. I won't read through them. Article three is the middle school. Article four is the operating budget. And article five is the teacher contract. Important dates, uh, at least important to me, I hope important to you. Of course, tonight is an important date. I've already presented the budget to the Durham uh, Town Council. I'll be presenting the budget to the Medbury Select Board on January 20th, and I'll be presenting the budget to the Lee Selectman on January 27th. Major, major meeting for the school system is February 4th, 2020. Um, basically, it will be uh, very similar to what you're seeing tonight. We'll have the architect here, uh, and he'll be talking about the middle school and be able to answer specific questions that you have. Um, but ultimately, uh, February 4th is the voting day in this room to move the budget to the voters. So February 4th is an, a critically important date. And then of course, March 10th is where you all have an opportunity to say yay or nay on the middle school and on the operating budget. If you um, have any questions, I'll be glad to do, to answer your questions related to the budget. Uh, something I'd like to see, for, um, since we've had tuition uh, students, I always see everything lumped in, and I'm curious if you guys have segmented, uh, especially the outcomes, SAT, I know that for quite a while we had 100% graduation, now we're at 98, mm -hmm. um, SAT scores, things like that, and I'd like to see that broken out. I don't know if you guys have that segmented, but. Uh, uh, we d in the folders that are out there, it's actually broken out, um, but not by town, but I can do that. I'd be glad okay. to do that for you. Yeah, I'd like to see how much, if anything, that we're being impacted um, by Barrington and see sure. if it has a negative consequence. Thanks. Yeah, I can tell you that uh, we've done that um, a couple of times and uh, the Barrington students have not negatively impacted our SAT scores. In fact, in one year, the Barrington students' collective SAT scores were actually higher than ours. So they're doing great academically. But I can, pro uh, I can provide you that detail. You wrote your name down on the slot, right? So I'll make sure I get you that. They've done great. They've transitioned great. They're really wonderful kids. We don't let you have two questions. I'm uh, Dean Rubin from Lee, but I'm not writing my name down. Uh, Radical. You said that uh, when you produce the, uh, the millage estimates, that you assume the appraisal, you assume the town values stay the same. Mm -hmm. Are you assuming that the appraisals stay the same and you're applying the new ratios, or are you? Come, come to the microphone, so. Correct ratio. Do it on the microphone, so. Thanks, Sue. So yes, we do have the correct ratios for apportionment, but we don't have the new assessed value for each community. Right. That comes in in October. Okay. Thanks, Dean. Thank you. Question? I'm Cecile Gunn Desmond, and I live in Lee. I have a daughter in fifth grade and a son in first grade at Mastway. Um, one thing that struck me about the budget in the letter that you sent out was that there are no new positions. Correct. And so I'm curious about my special interest happens to be the world language program mm -hmm. and the expansion of that into the younger grades, the lower grades, and so, and especially into fifth grade, because it's such a piece that's missing in the middle school. I understand it's an issue of space as well, and I recognize there's a lot of uh, other pieces that impact it. So, um, but I'm wondering if you could, if, there, if the board or the administration could talk about how this budget doesn't necessarily address any of that expansion. Sure. As well as what are potential future plans budget wise mm -hmm. to address that expansion of world language. If it's not, because clearly it's not in here, right? So um, why, so I, I, I can 
imagine the middle school bond has a lot to do with that. Um, but if there are other pieces of it, I'd be, I'd be very interested to learn about that. Yep. Thank you for that question, Cecile. We actually have a working committee on world language and they have done great work. And um, the board wanted to, uh, they gave the, the committee a charge. Uh, Jay and Todd have been working on, on this issue. So world language is a special interest of mine as well. And um, so there's a couple of things that right now, uh, the board hasn't got the full report from the committee. They got the, they got the recommendation for fifth grade. And so there's a full report that should come out by the end of this school year. So two issues that beyond that are the, is the space at the current school. And um, so as you could see from the design, we've actually designed the new middle school so it would include an expansion of world language. Uh, but that issue has not been addressed yet by the school board because the report isn't in. And um, it wouldn't be part of this proposed budget because we don't have the report in time to build it into this budget. So the board is actively um, seeking information related to world language um, and in, in considering how to best implement it. I, I would predict it would definitely be in two, two stages, fifth grade, and then uh, we'll look at uh, elementary models. The committee that we have going is looking at elementary models and um, ultimately we'll be making recommendations to the school board. So the school board should have a complete report by the end of the school year. Got it. Um, if I might. Yeah, sure. Um, so is there um, a plan to address the fifth grade instructor and their availability in the current middle school before the new middle school is built? In other words, is there a way, f I mean, I know there's a lot of issues involved, space, mm -hmm. you know, there are ways in which there's, ways in which the um, world language teachers can be mobile and, and integrate into classrooms yeah. in ways that we, we know from the presentation they gave and models that work in that way. So I'm hoping, um, because my daughter who's in fifth now is is going to be taking you know world language next year in sixth grade and picking up that curriculum then my son who's in first he's going to fall I think he's going to fall in that window of students that don't get it until they hit the middle school like it's going to be introduced in, in in a timeline from what I understand in a way K through two he's going to miss that introduction yeah. And he's going to be in that slice of students where it isn't brought down from fifth grade and it isn't introduced up from kindergarten. So he's going to miss all that window. So the first, his up first opportunity will be fifth grade, but that's not in four years. Right. So, the, so I mean, the, my, my, it's, it's a very personal you know, <laughs> concern about my kid, but, um, but my concern is for the community in general, in terms of what service world language provides for the community and our general curriculum and instruction. And all of those things are inf information you're getting from the committee, which I think is fantastic. I'm just hoping that we don't keep delaying the fifth grade teacher for world language until we have the new middle school. I think there are ways to address that and I recognize that the committee is doing hard work and is getting that report ready by the end of this year. And I, there's, I don't think there's any way to speed that up, right? Right. But I hope that we don't keep pushing, kicking the can down the road and not dealing with fifth grade simply because of space. Like, I think there are solutions for that. Thank you, Sister. Thank you. Other questions about the budget? Three, Dean, I, I don't one have night. a question about the budget, but I do want to say I'm uh, sorry uh, Kenny Rotner isn't here, and I hope he gets better soon. Oh, thank you. We all share that thought. I think you can end public hearing now. I have a motion to end the budget hearing. Denise? A motion to end the budget hearing. Moved by Denise, second by Brian. All in favor? The budget hearing is in. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Thank you all for coming.